here. Okay, hit record and I'm gonna share my screen. And I'm gonna start out by sharing um, a screen from Digital World Biology, which is our company, which um, is somewhat out of date, but you know, we never update our own website. <laughs> That's just how it goes. And I'm gonna actually kind of make that a little bit smaller. But I'm sharing this because we have on, um, I, I put in this, um, on uh, in our blog, I, I wrote a, a blog uh, earlier in the pandemic and I have links here that I like. So I'm gonna go down to our blog and scroll down to um, new viruses and old drugs because we're looking at ways that you could repurpose drugs and see if existing drugs could be used to treat COVID-19, which in fact, one of the ones we looked at here is the protease inhibitor, or it's a, a related to the protease inhibitor that uh, Pfizer is uh, just had approved. Is, anyway. this the, is this the one that you did like a little webinar on Innovate Bio um, back in 2020? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that was really good, but this will be great to get a little, uh, you know, refresher. Yeah, I'm not gonna look at the whole thing, but I have some links in here that I think are nice for getting started with understanding what's on nextstrain.org. So I'm just gonna scroll down to that point where you see it says, um, uh, new coronavirus phylogeny versus geography. And what I wanna show you is these were data reports that they were coming out with early on in the pandemic where they would take uh, data sets and explain them and explain how they were using NextStrain to understand them. And this is something that is not, not entirely clear right now from if you just go to NextStrain. So I'll take uh, COVID-19 in Iceland. If I just click that link. What you're seeing here is a data set from Iceland from, um, I guess, April, 2020. The sequences from, it's very at the very bottom, January, you see January, 2020 through February, 2020, March, 2020 and April, 2020. And the question is, uh, where, where are the strains coming from that are infecting people from Iceland? And as you scroll through this and you kind of mouse over the pie graph, you get to see uh, what countries contributed the most COVID-19 to Iceland, <laughs> at least based on the data set that they had at that time. Okay. You can also, um, there's, this is part of a kind of a narrative, a story. And if you kind of click the dots up on top, you'll see different parts of the story and about how travel histories are revealing local transmission. And you can kind of follow the phylogenetic tree and see uh, you know, what, what they say about it or what they said about it. As all this was kind of written a couple of years ago. Okay, so that was Iceland. Um, another one of these uh, stories that I have linked here was from, um, oops, search site again. There we go. All right, another one of these stories um, I've got another one with community transmission or travel, trying to figure that out. And another one that uh, states are not islands <laughs> or what happens in one state does not stay in that state. <laughs> and that's when people were uh, discovering that a lot of the, um, the transmission in New York, for example, was coming from other countries and not necessarily from people on the West Coast <laughs> or moving East. And again, if you go up to the top. Yeah, don't blame you, Washington State. That's right, don't blame Washington. And you use these buttons, um, you can kind of follow through and they'll explain what's going on and how they sample and um, talk about uh, you know, where things come from. And then they highlight the different clades 
and highlight the transmission. I found those were really useful for even just understanding what was happening at next strain and different ways that people could use it to understand the data. Okay, now what I'm gonna do is just go to nextstrain.org. I'll leave, you, you can find that on our website. I'll, I'll put the link. Yeah, I'll put the link to that blog into Slack with those tutorials. If you go to nextstrain.org, um, there's a lot of information beyond SARS-CoV-2. There are other narratives. This one is about West Nile virus and there's um, Ebola in the Dominican Republic. There are data sets from um, with chikungunya and uh, bird flu and seasonal flu. So lots of flu for you, Jan. <laughs> and uh, yeah, now we'll go, we'll look at SARS-CoV-2. And when I get there, just a quick reminder that you can also get there like this. You can see there's data sets for measles, mumps, tuberculosis, Zika virus. They have a lot of interesting things. So before uh, going on anywhere, I'm gonna just go through what, what you're seeing here. This is showing you 3,187 data from 3,187 genomes sampled between December 2019 and January 2022. And I think it's really important to realize that this is probably a somewhat biased data set because gosh, not everybody sequences viral genomes. And some people sequence them and then discourage, get discouraged from ever doing it again. <laughs> because all travels cut off to their country, right? So, so you have to keep that in mind that just because it looks like there's a lot of virus in one place, in fact, if you look at it, you'd think the US has more COVID infections than anywhere else in the world. <laughs> That's just because people do more sequencing. Early on, you'd look at this and you'd think, huh, how come there aren't any strains from other states except for Washington? <laughs> Again, different states, different places do more sequencing and contribute more sequences to the, the database. So there, there's always that slant. Nevertheless, what you see is pretty informative. And we have um, the two main ways that are showing uh, viral uh, spread are there's a phylogenetic tree over here on the left side, and there is a graph of the world over here on the right side. I th you can see um, with these pie graphs, you can kind of see what the most prevalent strains are. If you mouse over the, the graphs, the, um, the dots in the tree get bigger and you mouse, mouse over different parts. And I think it's interesting to see how this has changed over time. Over here in this date range, you can see uh, how everything has changed from um, December 14th, 2019 through today, which I find kind of incredible. And again, some of this is corresponding to how much people sequence. And it, it's all starting and you can see on the on one side, it's moving through the phylogenetic tree, right? And on the other side, it's um, showing the geography. Also, I think the, um, uh, the diversity bar changes accordingly. Oh yeah, yeah, the diversity bar changes. Well, maybe. I'm sure the graph below changes. Actually, if I scroll down, no, you know they might not have been showing that, uh, displaying data that way at that point. We'll look at that. I saw in a it bit. changing earlier, earlier in your first demo. So regardless, I don't say changing now either. I 
think I might have just been looking at um, one amino acid, though. I'm, I don't know. Anyway, we can see here that um, at this point, where are we? We're right now. Yeah, we can see where the Delta variant appeared. We could see where Omicron variant started appearing. And as we, uh, I'm gonna make this narrower and zoom in a little bit. Yeah, there we go. There, okay. Anyway, so back to the tree. I guess I mouse over this and look at the different clades. Um, I also see the spots where they're located in the tree expand. I see these little, the little bubbles, dots get larger. And the, what is a clade? The clades are groups, are, are viral strains that share common sets of mutations. I don't really know, you know what it, what it takes for them to decide that, oh, we have a new clade, we have a new thing that we're gonna name Omicron now, or a new thing we're gonna name Delta. I don't know how many uh, variants they need. Do you know, Alyssa? How many, how many mutations they need to have to decide they've got a new thing? That's actually a good question. I do not know that off the top of my head, but now I wanna know. <laughs> I'm, I have a feeling it's in the help documentation, but I, I do find it, it interesting to look at this graph and see, you know, okay, so we had this original one and then that changed and that split off this other thing and that split off Delta and then Delta kind of started taking over the world. And then out of nowhere from back at this original one, then we got Omicron, which was pretty incredible and has like 30 different changes from Delta. So it's, you, you think, oh no, evolution is just happening with one strain and just going one way, but no, no, the other viruses that are still around can evolve too. Viruses don't care, they're just trying to reproduce and whatever conditions are, are going to allow them to do that, that's what they will do. Um, we can learn about the people, oh yeah, there's something else we can do with this too if we want. We can, um, there is a way I think, I'm not seeing right now. There was a way to like change the timeline. Oh yeah, here we go. We can change the date range that we're looking at in the graph too. If I um, drag this little guy here over on the um, left-hand side in the date range over, I can bring it back and look at an earlier point in time or if I want to look uh, more at a later point in time, I can drag that forward and just focus on what's happening now. I can also look at the individuals and the individual sequences in this graph. So if I carefully move my cursor and I hover over one, I can click any of these. And if I click it, I will get information about that particular sequence. So this one is a sequence from the Delta clade. Um, it was collected December 8th, 2021 from Liechtenstein. I can see the, the person who contributed it and I can scroll down. I can see that it came from a human. In fact, one of the kind of cool data sets in here early on is there are um, sequences from ferrets from the Denmark ferrets that were getting, getting SARS-CoV-2 <laughs> uh, also and all got uh, euthanized. And I can scroll down and I can see what the different mutations are. So this particular strain, we're uh, often interested right now in mutations in the S protein because the S protein is involved in infection. And I can see that in the S protein, there is a mutation at, um, 3 and E19 that changes it to arginine. There's one that changes glycine to uh, an aspartic acid at 142. Um, somebody asked me earlier about these dashes that happen. That's a mutation that 
causes, that's a mutation that causes a deletion of an amino acid. So there was a glutamic acid at 156 and it's no longer there. I'm guessing this must be a, uh, a deletion of three bases. Can anybody tell me why? Well, it could be more than three, but something that you could divide by three. Where, where do we talk about three bases? Is it codon? Yes, you got it. That's right. I don't know how many sets of three bases, but the thing is, if you only deleted one or two, you'd get a frame shift mutation and you might knock out that virus and it wouldn't replicate and we wouldn't find it. But if you just, if you may mutate, if you um, delete like a set of three bases, then it might not, it might just change the function a little or it might not be a problem at all. But you're still gonna have an amino acid sequence. That's great, Joy. Okay, so- Thank you, Ma. <laughs> so I have, in, in my class, I had my students um, copy all these and paste them somewhere and then investigate whether or not uh, those were going to impact antibody binding, which I did in another way. Okay, so now I'm gonna click outside of here and get outside of this. But you can see we can look at you know, any different thing in here. And I have my students go, I'll go look at it different things because well, then I know they're doing independent work. Um, I also had them do uh, something with this too. And that is we can filter in different ways. And I had them filter by, uh, let's see, how did I do this? QCID, open data. There was a way to look at, oh yeah, I had them look uh, color by emerging lineage. And the weird thing is, is that I wrote the instructions for the for my students to do this in early November. Okay, and I said, okay, co do use color by emerging lineage, and what that does is it kind of highlights the new things, right, that people are just starting to see. And if you think early November is right here, <laughs> so Omicron wasn't a thing yet. <laughs> So um, yeah, actually, I can even go back to November. So it was kind of wild to all of a sudden have something happening that really was going on. You know, there we go. Well, that's October. So yeah, it was just just starting to appear. This is a that's November thirteenth. So we were just seeing it. I probably I think I wrote it probably like November first or something like that. It was a very, really weird thing to have happen when you're teaching. Okay, we'll go back to where we were. Coloring by clade. All right, so how do we get these different clades and see these different mutations? Or what, what else can we find out about them? might remember uh, we had the geography. And by the way, uh, the way Uwe taught me that you can move these parts of the, um, the, the display, the dashboard around is by making your browser window bigger or smaller. If I make my browser window bigger, it puts these, it puts the geography graph and the phylogeny side by side. I have to admit, I've been doing this for a while and it's never occurred to me, like, how did that get there? <laughs> how did I move those there? <laughs> All right, so down to geography, you can see right now where things are more prevalent around the world. And again, I can mouse over the clades. I think I can mouse over the clades and see, or I can just use the graph. I can zoom in, um, I guess what? use the plus thing to zoom in and see different uh, parts of the world and see what kinds of uh, viruses are more prevalent in some parts of the world than others. 
or I can click the minus to zoom out. It really kind of works like Google Maps. And as I scroll down, what I see is I have a, a graph at the very bottom that shows me frequencies of the different clades throughout, um, throughout the world. Oh yeah, this is probably why we weren't seeing it before because it starts at January, 2021. We were, we were looking, playing it before in a different session and we weren't seeing anything in this graph. And I think it's because the play feature starts at 2020. And I think they just added this January, 2021, would be my guess. Anyway, you can see in January, we, had, we mostly had um, played 20B and 20A and alpha. And then we got um, Lambda and Mu appeared, uh, Delta appeared this summer. We have different variants of Delta and you can see in November, Omicron kind of appeared. So people have been really early on from the beginning, people started to use this data to try to figure out, are there mutations that are changing the ability of SARS-CoV-2 to infect people. And then later on, they've been looking at, are the mutations that change the ability to escape from the immune system? And the way we can do some of this is, this is a graph of the positions in the genome and all the genes. And the graph shows you how many mutations are happening at different positions. And if I uh, carefully click the graph, carefully click like one of these peaks in the graph, which is not always this easy to do. I'm gonna make my window bigger, my display bigger. Then I and think Sa I can Sandra, click. Sandra, yeah. before, you, before you go there and click, um, advise everybody also to watch what happens to the color bars right underneath. Because yes. they're, changing, they're changing accordingly to give you a more close up or something. Of yes. That in which you click the uh, click the uh, bar. And Uwe, you are also reminding me that there is another way to help yourself with clicking. And I think it is to drag. You're right. <laughs> drag drag the little air, the little triangles at the bottom. And the gray area mm -hmm. is the area that is zoomed in up on top. Right. So here we have the S gene, which codes for the spike protein. And there you see it above. And the graph, the numbers are relative to this. OK, so if I just look at the S gene and I click uh, one of these peaks, so maybe look at this one. <laughs> I carefully click one of those peaks. It's not terribly easy to see, but that peak has turned kind of a blue color, so it's not easy to see. The peak has turned kind of a blue color to show that I've selected it. And it is telling me that this is codon number 452 in the spike protein. And as I look down below, what I see is what actually change, changes at 452. So I can see that in January, most of the strains had a leucine there at 452. And then we started getting strains with an arginine at that position. And now it looks like maybe a little more leucine. And I can scroll up and I can see how does this relate to the world with that particular genotype. And I can keep scrolling and I can see how does that relate to my clades. So I can see that, and I want to move this down so I have... Uh, well, because I reset the zoom. I want to remember which is which. The yellow one is arginine and the kind of aqua is leucine. Okay. All right, so Delta has an arginine at position 452. Omicron has a leucine at position 452. What does that do in terms of function? Well, that's why I like IC in 3D. Because <laughs> I can see is position 452 in the, the um, 
receptor binding domain, would it might it affect binding to ACE2? Might it affect binding to antibodies or the ability of antibodies to bind to that domain? I can look at that. And we can find some others also. Um, let's see. Oh, maybe we'll look at this one, 478. I very carefully click it. I don't know uh, for sure I've clicked it until I see it change blue and to blue. And I see this is codon 478 in the S protein. And codon 478 starts out as the threonine and gets replaced. Well, a lot of sequences now have a lysine there. And I can see that, um, which was which? Okay, threonine is the aqua. I can see that they, a lot of them had that threonine there, but both Omicron and Delta have, um, have a lysine at that position. So again, I could, I could go to IC and 3D and check things out. I can see too that some of these guys, some of these Delta strains have reverted or gotten new mutations that change it back. Okay, um, you can also see a little bit about the distribution, I think, of where the mutations are happening. If we look at the S protein, the spike protein, we can see there are a lot of mutations around this area. And that is the area where, um, where the receptor binding domain is. Of course, we have a lot of mutations here and we have a really high number of mutations right here. And I have no idea what, <laughs> what that does. Again, but though I can click them, very carefully click it, and I can see that that, that position, I guess that's what, 681? Yeah, mm -hmm. 681. That one actually has three different amino acids that could be at that position. Um, a proline, a histidine, and an arginine. And if I look up here, I see that, um, Proline, okay, histidine, arginine. I can see that Omicron has the histidine. The older versions of the virus have a proline and then um, uh, Delta has the arginine. Is that a difference between how they infect or their ability to uh, bind to the ACE2 receptor? Maybe. I don't know. But again, I can go to ICN 3D and I can find out, or at least I can, I can look at its effect on the interactions in the structures that we have. Okay. So there are um, a lot of pretty cool things that you can do with next strain. I, I really like going through some of those tutorials. I will put them in Slack. There are other ways you can graph things. There are um, clock, does, you know, ways you can look at things, uh, all kinds of cool stuff. Uh, there are ways you can uh, select things. I want to um, just show you quick how you can get back to where you started. Let's see, I was on the radial rectangular version. And if you notice here, it's saying color by genotype. And it's showing, it's telling you S is the spike protein, position 681. To go back to where I began, I changed the coloring back to um, clade. And then I get back to where I started. Or if I forget, I just log out and I log back in. <laughs> Refresh the browser helps also a little bit, doesn't? Um, maybe a couple <laughs> times. <laughs> so that's that's pretty much what I have to say about nextjournal.org. 
You guys have any questions? Everyone's looking stunned. <laughs> oh, there's just so many things that you can do. Um, did, right in, your class, in your class, Sandy, did they just mostly look at um, SARS-CoV-2? Yeah, I, well, I had them, I, this year I did, I, I had them, what else did I have them look at? I, at the beginning of the year, I had them do some things with CRISPR because I like them to see in, C, in IC and 3D, I like them to, I like to try to have my students figure out, understand the difference between nucleotides and amino acids. And CRISPR structures are great because you have both DNA, RNA, and amino acids. So you can see, oh, look, RNA has all U's. You know, that's kind of nice, right? <laughs> has this different base in it. So we did look at some CRISPR structures. And then we also, um, yeah, let me just call up my, our site. I have collections. I also had them look at antifreeze proteins. So I have, I've been making collections of proteins. We have an um, iPad app called Molecule World that you can download collections and it opens up in, or you can just look at the, look at the, uh, the PDB IDs and you can open them up in IC and 3D. But I had them look at, uh, antifreeze proteins are really nice because they're small. So what I tend to do is I'll give each student their own one to investigate and then they have to find different kinds of bonds and put pictures <laughs> into the discussion area in Canvas. But these ones are small, so they're really easy to work with. But yeah, we've got lots of collections here, lots of, we used to spend time, mostly I was fixated for a while on um, individual mutations and how they affected the ability of, uh, you know, how they uh, made somebody more, made somebody likely to develop genetic diseases like, beer, like BRCA1 or um, other things. And so we looked at that a lot. And then we have some cool uh, influenza drug, or influenza collection, a cool influenza collection, which I can give you the PDB IDs for these. I think I took them out, but a lot of these um, are pairs. And the only difference between them is that there is a single amino acid single nucleotide change, which changes a single nucleotide, changes a single um, amino, acid, amino acid. And it makes one member of the pair resistant to a particular drug and one member sensitive. I'm thinking I might go and um, look at uh, some of the uh, prediction stuff that Jael's put into IC and 3D with mutations and see if that matches what we see from actual mutant structures. <laughs> but, you know, uh, we've done different things. I could, is it easily bored is the right way to say it? <laughs> or um, want to, you know, explore different things in the class. So one year we might focus on influenza more, another year we might focus on mutations more. Um, for the past couple of years, we've focused on SARS CoV 2. Not surprising. <laughs> well, and then all these things, cool things have come out, like next strain and and I want the students to be interested. I figure they'll be interested in that, if nothing else. It is pretty cool how much data you can see there, you know, like over time, over the entire world. Um. Yeah, well, you know, there's 130, over 130,000 structures in the NCBI database. And that doesn't include all the chemical structures because you can look at chemical structures in IC and 3D too. And then now we've got alpha folds. So there'll be millions, well, a lot of predicted structures. So yeah, I think learning how to work with data. What did you just say? Now we have AlphaFold. Mm -hmm. Oh, AlphaFold. Mm -hmm. And you can use IC in 3D if you uh, 
choose alpha fold and put in a protein sequence, it'll predict the structure. Haven't tried it yet, but, mm -hmm. and I'm sure it works better for some than others <laughs> and some regions than others. Well, thank you for doing this again. I appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, thanks a lot. Yeah, oh, right, I recorded it. I can stop.